Hello, and welcome to Friends for Life, a podcast of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod's National Mission. We're here to come alongside you as we journey through life under the cross. What does it look like to care for our neighbors in body and soul? How do we tend to our own body and soul? How can we speak up for life? And finally, how do we share the faith with the next generation? Join us as we have these conversations and learn together. We hope you'll stick around and be our friends for life. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm your host, Steph Nugebauer, here with my guest, Pastor Jeff Robinson. This is a conversation about how younger people need older people and older people need younger people and how they're meant to fit together and live together within the family of God. Pastor, would you please introduce yourself? I'm uh, Jeff Robinson. I'm the uh, mission exec, human care exec, and stewardship exec for the uh, Indiana District of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod. I have four children and 14 grandchildren. Wow. Um, our children are scattered all over the United States. Well, thank goodness for technology where we can stay connected even when we're miles away. Right. Oh, Pastor, for a podcast season that is focusing on the family, why do you think it's important to talk about this role of older generations and younger generations within the family together? I think it's important because um, I don't know when this started, but probably uh, in my uh, childhood, this was beginning to be shown that in our society, youth has been valued above everything. And I don't know that that's, uh, well, I know it's not biblical. The biblical record shows us that uh, elderly people have been honored, should be honored. God's word says that. And also, when you start looking at the number of people who are aged, who are actually got put into leadership positions, there are a number of them. There are a number of young people, too, so I'm not pitting one against the other. But I think it's important for us to remember that we are all a family of God, and there are opportunities for exchange, positive exchange on both sides of how old you are, young and old. And how does the fourth commandment play into all of this? Well, that's, that's a, uh, a good question, and I you just happen to have my catechism here because I knew that was going to come up. At least I, I thought it would. You know, the, we are taught that um, we should fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. Generally, you would think of parents, and I know that when I taught uh, children this, of course, I was that was the first uh, authority that I taught them about. But as you look at the explanation and the understanding of who authorities are, then you move uh, naturally to grandparents. In fact, there is a passage that is used in the explanation of the catechism. It says to show respect to the ages, and the passage is Leviticus 19.32, which says, rise in the presence of age and show respect for the elderly and revere your God. And I know that when I was a young uh, lad, my parents taught me that if, uh, for example, if I were in public transportation and an elderly person came in, I was to uh, get up and let them have my seat out of respect for them, but also they maybe, maybe needed to sit when I didn't. And having become an older man, um, I do understand more the aches and pains of aging than, than I did when I was 12 years old. Uh, so I think there's that aspect that is uh, uh, certainly important. But God honors old people as well as uh, young people. I mean, he saved us all. Age isn't a factor for him as far as who should be saved or who shouldn't be, uh, who should be respected. His word clearly says, you know, the honor of the aged. So I guess that's where I would emphasize what I would emphasize from the uh, fourth commandment, that to treat older people as um, kind of throwaway people is certainly not according to God's word. And what do you think is behind this cultural shift that you've noticed as as you've grown as far as youth being prized above all, the elderly being less desired, less respected. Is this just an American culture thing, or do you think that this is across the board, or is it just kind of heightened here in America for whatever reason? Well, I I notice it here, but I I have to tell you that I I can't speak for the rest of the world. I've been privileged to go in lots of places, 
uh, in the world. And it depends on the culture that you're in. I would say more Western uh, cultures tend to not respect the elderly. And I say that because I have been privileged to go to Korea. And I was, at that point, this would be 2008, I was pushing my uh, mother in a wheelchair because she wanted to go. And I took her there because we had a, my older brother was stationed there. And I was amazed at how there was such respect for her and me because we were older. I think it depends on the culture. And in, in our culture, unfortunately, I think the lack of respect actually begins with how our culture treats the really young. And what I'm getting at there is as you go to those countries where their uh, abortion is uh, seen as positive, then the youth that I'm talking about that are being uh, highlighted are the teenagers, the 20 year olds, the 30 year olds and so forth. But on both ends of the spectrum, there's a lack of respect for life. Does that make sense? Yeah, there certainly seems to be a correlation. Right. And so as we um, have a culture in our country that says abortion is okay, we can destroy life on that uh, side of things. So also that same culture says that old people, uh, when they become useless in the eyes of whoever, they should be destroyed too. And that is not scriptural at all, either side of that. You make a good case of why, you know, according to scripture, we are to honor older generations. How is the family as a whole, children, parents, grandparents, how's the family as a unit served by holding its older family members in high regard, honoring them, cherishing them? Well, aside from obeying uh, God's uh, commandments, uh, which is always right uh, and pleasing, and I shared that scripture that says that we should respect elderly, I can speak from my own experience that my grandparents were a great blessing to me. They had wisdom from the years of uh, life that they'd experienced. They were great examples to me as to how I should live and how I should treat others. Uh, and I think that's the value that you have when, when uh, we as family, all members of the family are encouraged and respected and treated well. When you uh, exclude the elderly from the family gatherings, you lose out. So also, when we do have everyone together, it's a great joyous occasion. It's probably a very real foretaste of the feast of the celebration that's to come in the new creation when all are together. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Pastor, how did your grandparents shape you as you were a child, and, and what role did they play in your life? What did you learn from them, and, and what do you hope to share with your own grandchildren? Well, I, I, one grandmother I didn't know, she died, died having my aunt. My other grandmother died fairly young, but I do recall her. When I was a kid, we moved a lot from uh, various locations in the United States because my father was training military personnel. So it's interesting to me to consider, uh, I was supposedly in a very progressive school in California and moved, we had to move to Ohio with my grandparents for a time uh, because my dad was overseas. And I went to a two-room school and they thought I was horribly backward because they were much more advanced in that two-room school than the, the pro supposedly progressive school in California. Mm -hmm. And I'm just sharing this because my grandmother tutored me to get me caught up. And so she was a, a great blessing that way. And I'm sure I wasn't very easy to tutor because in the second grade, it's a little <laughs> hard to suddenly realize you're way behind. So she was positive that way. Both of my grandfathers and, and my one grandmother that I did get to know, they all were faithful Christians. They went to church every Sunday. Uh, they were not Lutheran. My uh, one grandfather, Robinson, he read all of my catechetical material and said, this is good, and put his stamp of approval on, on the uh, catechetical training that I was getting uh, at, by the Lutheran pastor in Florida when we were living there. So they taught me that uh, serving God first was most important by their actions. My um, other grandfather was the one who taught me how to pray. I remember him telling me 
that the answer to um, not falling asleep in your prayers was to kneel on the floor, which is what he did, and put his he, he turned a chair around and kneeled that way. And I said, why are you doing that? And he said, well, keeps me awake. So, <laughs> you know, as your knees begin to hurt, you begin to think about what God wants you to uh, to be doing and, and so forth. So that's kind of a humorous thing, but the point he made was prayer is important uh, and you need to be doing it. So in, in, in those ways, they taught me that God was most important. Then in their actions, you know, as a, as a kid, you watch what they do, how they treated people. And uh, my grandfather Robinson was a great evangelist. Um, he loved to fish. So he would take me fishing with him and he used to embarrass me when I was a kid because I didn't really, you know, it wasn't what I understood should be done. Now, as an adult, I think it's a great thing that he did. But he would sit next to some other person who was fishing and talk to him about fishing for a while. And then he began to talk to him about Christianity. That was a great witness to me. The other thing that he liked to do, now this it dates me because telephone booths used to be you know, pretty <laughs> common. He would stop at every telephone booth. So we never got anywhere very quickly because he had to put tracks in there. That was his tract ministry. Uh, those things, you know, stick with you. Uh, consequently, I think along with what we were taught at church too, my older brother and I were we began to knock on doors at early ages. Um, probably, I think the first time we probably did it was 12, 13 years old to canvas communities for our church and that kind of thing. So. That was helpful too, but you know, grandparents were behind encouraging to do this. What value do you think as a whole it, it brought you as a child to see this faith modeled from your grandparents, maybe as opposed to peers or even your own parents? I think the value was that this was something that was important to the family as a whole, the whole family. It impressed me as a, as a young child that this was important. And it meant something not only to my grandparents, but uh, they, they let me know that their parents, you know, so my great grandparents, this was important as well. I suppose probably seeing it as a child too, it, you know, maybe you're not thinking of this in the moment, but as you grow older into adolescence and then young adulthood, you see your grandparents being faithful, clinging to their, their own faith and trust in the Lord and realizing, wow, this actually holds water. This, mm -hmm. this provides you with a view of this longevity, this faithfulness that remains even through the hardships that are inevitable in life. And I'm sure that's a witness just in itself. Right. Mm-hmm. As a grandfather yourself, how do you see your role as very integral to the life of your adult children and your grandchildren, and, and how has your role changed as you've aged and become a grandfather? Well, I would say that um, as when I was parenting my children, and they're all grown up at this point, uh, you know, out of the house, I wanted to show them that being a Christian was the most important thing in any person's life and particularly theirs. So my wife and I modeled that for them uh, with our own actions. So we guided them. There were, you know, in decisions that we made with what they could do and couldn't do, it all went back to what it, what would be pleasing to God. They didn't always see it that way, but, uh, you know, that's, that's really what was in our minds. Now that they've become adults, I, I do my best to support them as they raise their own children and not become overbearing so that I let them uh, make their own decisions. Some I may not agree with uh, the way they do things, but I don't uh, openly express any disagreement with it because I think that's important that it, you, you've raised your kids to be adults. You have to trust them to do what they are trying to do as Christians themselves. I was uh, blessed that my mother was that way for me. Um, she didn't tell me how to raise my children or anything like that once I became an adult. Uh, my father was not in the picture at this point, so he didn't have any influence really at all that way. And so as a, a grandfather, I want to influence my grandchildren uh, to understand that uh, they need to obey their parents. I also want to influence them, and as my grandfather 
grandparents did me to impress upon them how important church is. And preferably, I would love them, I would like for them to be uh, Lutheran because I believe that's the closest, we, we are the closest in our understanding of what God's Word says of any denomination out there. Um, and I say that as one who is a convert myself, so that's important to me. But I can't be overburdening on the parents, their parents, or the grandchildren in promoting that. And I do it, so I do it through my example. And when they ask me to talk about uh, catechetical things, I do. Uh, at the present time, I've got a granddaughter who doesn't live near an LCMS church uh, who's asked me to, to teach her the catechism. So we do that weekly uh, via Zoom. Uh, and um, her mother and father are in agreement with it at this point. So uh, I think the personal witness is, is very important. Um, so what they see me do is really important. You mentioned I mean, most of your, your grandchildren are, are scattered throughout the states far away. So how do you maintain that connection? I think there are a lot of grandparents in your shoes who don't have grandchildren nearby. And I guess what's your encouragement for them to maintain closeness and to foster that relationship even if they aren't in close proximity? Well, we try to keep in contact. I use uh, FaceTime uh, to teach uh, my granddaughter you know, many of the grandchildren today uh, have cell phones, so they connect with me via that way. And I, I even noticed this with my older children. They don't really want me to call them. They'd rather I text them. So we text pretty regularly. That's a generational thing, I think, uh, that we need to be aware of. So that makes things a lot easier. Well, my wife is constantly communicating with the children and grandchildren as well. And whenever we have the opportunity, we go and try to support them in person. We do a lot of driving sometimes. Uh, so I've got grandchildren that live about seven hours from here. And my wife will tell me, there's a play they're in. You need to be taking time off. So let's go. Pastor, as part of your role, it's my understanding that you lead senior ministries for your district. Is that correct? That is correct. And what do you do? What are some projects or initiatives or resources that you have in your district? And maybe looking at the bigger picture, how do you see intergenerational ministry being key to the growth and vitality of the church? Well, it depends on the size of the church as to what happens. Since COVID, our senior adult ministry has slowed down quite a bit. That proved a big challenge. So I need to be upfront about that. But the larger churches tend to have groups that do things, you know, seniors do things by themselves. In the smaller parishes, the more family-like parishes, everybody does everything together. So there really isn't the separation, which is what I would prefer and encourage. So that that's more what happened when I was in the parish. Now I served uh, last two parishes. I served were rural parishes, and so it's easier, I think, in the rural setting to have these things happen because there is more of an understanding of you know grandparents being involved in in everything, uh, and there's a lot of uh, intergenerational work that goes on together. Farming, for example, you know, grandpa and, and dad are often farming together and then the teenagers get involved as soon as they can or even before that, uh, if the child is able to, to work. So it, it seemed to flow pretty naturally in the parishes I served that everybody got together and uh, so it was a big celebration kind of thing. As far as senior adult ministry here for the district, We've had some events where we've tried to encourage senior adults in their abilities to continue to mentor uh, the younger generations, uh, to be involved in evangelism themselves, because there are a lot of seniors who don't go to church, don't know Christ, so we, we've done a lot of that kind of thing here. It just it seems like it's kind of a trend within the church in uh, recent decades to devote time and space for small groups. And so kind of compartmentalizing groups mm -hmm. of uh, 
all women or all moms or all young adults into their own Bible studies and small groups. And what you're suggesting, it sounds like, is, well, let's take a step back. And there may be space for that, but also... Let's not let that be at the expense of intentionally gathering people together, not just for worship, but for other events within the church where age provides no boundary. We should be serving alongside each other. We should be doing church events together. We should be doing Bible studies, younger and older, all mixed, because we have things to learn from each other in between generations. Is that correct? Is that what I'm hearing you say? Sure. Yeah. Yes, you do hear me well. And in fact, when I was in the parish, we did uh, have senior high Bible studies if the students wanted to go to that, but we didn't restrict those students if they wanted to come to the adult Bible class. They were certainly welcome there. And there was a certain amount of that going on uh, at that point. But um, you're, you're absolutely correct in what you heard me saying. All the other events that we had were not, there was no separation. It was everybody together. As I said, I think that tends to be a function of how large the parish is. If a parish you know, has over 1,000 members, they tend to compartmentalize more than the smaller parishes do. I read a recent... Barna study specific to intergenerational ministries, and it, it really highlighted what uh, younger generations are hoping to learn through mentorship with older generations. And the results were that it's necessary for younger and older generations to be together and to learn from each other to create and cultivate resilient people of God. And that is to say mm-hmm. that the younger generation, especially Gen Z, is likely to have anxiety, uh, greater feelings of loneliness, uncertainty about the future, and and just by sheer nature of their age, just inexperience with life. And what the older generations can provide is confidence, is mm-hmm. experience, is really contentment with the life that they've been given and what they've received from it, and also wisdom from the experiences that they've had and from the nurturing of their faith that's continued throughout their lifetime. Again, how do you see this of particular import, not just as we're talking about children and their grandparents, but also how this fits together within the greater body of Christ the family of believers. If you can, I guess, just recap why it's important for older generations and younger to be doing life together. The older generation can be a positive influence and encouragement to younger generations because they've experienced a lot of things and have learned in, in most cases, I would say, to not get too worked up about things because it's already happened before, in a sense, and there's a trust in God because, you know, you've gotten through it before. The anxiety about the future, I think, is, uh, is something that young people of whatever generation they are begin to wonder about because the future always is changing. Well, an older person can say, yes, it's changing, but there's also stuff that doesn't change, and God is one who doesn't change. So trust in him, Uh, and and that's what Scripture teaches us. When I was a young man, I stood for the draft. I thought I might end up in Vietnam, but God didn't choose me. My older brother ended up in, in the military. Was it a stressful time? Somewhat. I mean, you know, we we were worried about the future, but God saw us through it. And uh, my parents and grandparents were factors in helping me not become too stressed out about it, I guess is what I would say. So that that can be very helpful. I think stability is, is a key thing encouraging one in the faith, encouraging others in the faith would be key. I would like to turn that around a little bit, though, because we haven't talked yet about the positive effect that young people have on older people. 
uh, and I think that's important as well. I remember my grandfather saying something that was funny to me, but I understand it now. Uh, he always liked to say to me, I, Jeff, I, I think um, from the head up, I feel like I'm 18 years old, but from the neck down, the rest of me doesn't cooperate. <laughs> Well, by saying that to me, he helped me understand that he always had a, 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 an outlook of uh, interest, joy, and happiness about young people, whatever was going on. My mother um, was a, a woman who lived to be 90, but many of her friends were young people because she kept a positive attitude about young people and where they were going and, and that kind of thing. And uh, I try to do the same thing. I like to see what young people are doing, and I think that's a benefit because they can give me insights that I don't have uh, because of my age. Uh, just to give you an example, my, my grandson, who is, uh, he just turned 10 years old, he was with us on Thanksgiving, and so he went to church with us uh, at St. Paul's Lutheran here in Fort Wayne. After divine service, he started asking me all kinds of questions about, well, what does that mean? Why does this, what's that thing? For example, he said, why are those swords up there? I hadn't even noticed that there were swords in the, in the uh, chancel. Well, there are. Uh, they're part of, uh, in, in our parish we have, or in our church building we have, the symbols of the apostles. That's an example of, uh, of how a young person sees things and it's, interesting to them it's uh, new to them and it became new and fresh for me because i didn't even notice it but that's just one of many things they have uh, thoughts about the future which are valuable for us to listen to and learn from and encourage one another i would say that that's the other side of things if an older person just simply thinks about the past they're not going to be very happy about the future and i've seen that in in friends who all they do is grumble. Well, that's not healthy, that's not helpful, that's not trusting in God either. Uh, one of the most beautiful prayers that was prayed for me was um, when I went through my theological interview years ago, one of the professors who was there prayed that God would bless me in the ministry. And here was the beautiful part. He said, because you are the new generation for the church and you will be replacing us. Well, there has to be an understanding of that. You have to realize that God is still controlling everything and that the generations that may seem young and they are young and inexperienced in a certain way are the future. And so, however I can help influence that in a positive way uh, and they can influence me in a positive way, I, I rejoice in God for that. So I think that's important for us to say, too, hmm. in this podcast. Yeah, thank you. We have had a, a podcast episode devoted to exactly what you had, had just said, how our youth are our future, <laughs> and to be positive mm -hmm. about what the youth bring to our culture, just as society, but also as, as church, and how there's mm -hmm. value there as well. And I do think it's a tendency, even at my age in my 30s, to kind of eye roll or, or look at some of the things that are trending in the up and coming generations and be like, oh, brother, you know. Yeah. But maybe maybe there's some uphill battles there, but also there's some really positive and wonderful things, not to mention energy and, and, and hope and uh, new mm -hmm. ideas and new ways of doing things that aren't always bad. And so to be willing to embrace that, but then to offer your wisdom and your just availability, your, your presence to be there with them as a, as a coach <laughs> through life. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Thank you for making mention of that and for bringing that point up too. Pastor, thank you so much for your time today and for offering us your wisdom, your guidance, and um, what a wonderful prayer that we can all pray together as a church that the Lord would raise up this next generation to be faithful and to carry on the work of his church as he promises his church will remain. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a review. And don't forget to click the follower subscribe button so you don't miss out on upcoming episodes. 
You can find us on Facebook and Instagram as Friends for Life LCMS. And finally, listeners, we want to hear from you. Do you have an idea about a guest you'd like to hear from or a topic you want talked about? Email us at friendsforlife at lcms.org. We want to hear from you about what you want to hear about when it comes to issues of life. Thanks for joining us. Friends for Life is a podcast that discusses the life God has given and the people he has called you to serve right where you are in God's mission.